So today we are talking about um, estimating cash flows and the initial start to capital budgeting projects and how we do that from a finance perspective. We'll be looking at how to do some pro forma analysis. Some of you may have done this already in other courses. And what a pro forma analysis does is it enables us to focus on the question, uh, what will this project's, project's impact on the firm's total cash flows be if we go forward? So we actually look at the various cash inflows and outflows for a particular project and then determine what the net cash flows are, if they're positive or negative. Um, and then we can compare projects to in different options. So ultimately with pro forma, when it's done right, will be, it's important because it helps us to determine whether a project is good or not. And it also gives us a process for estimating expected cash flows for a project. We do use certain parts of the balance sheet and income statements when we're doing pro forma. We use the relevant parts. Uh, not all of them have to be used when we're doing the cash flow um, projections and estimates. And we can ignore the parts of the financial statements that don't change, whether the project is accepted or rejected. When we're doing these uh, cash flow estimations, all incremental cash flows must be considered when calculating the project's expected cash flows. So those are those incremental cash flows are cash flows that are directly, directly attributable to the adoption of a new project. And that's both cash inflows and cash outflows. So positive cash flows and negative cash flows. We have to consider all of them. We also have to consider opportunity costs, which is uh, the dollar cost of a foregone opportunity of using an asset already owned by the firm or a person already employed by the firm in a new project. Um, if you, I assume you've all taken introductory economics and you would have learned a little bit about opportunity costs there and in some other courses too. So new projects, we need to charge them for any assets that are used, as well as any wages and benefits paid to employees working on the new project as well. Sunk costs, um, you may have heard of sunk costs, and that's just a cost that has already been incurred and it can't be recovered. So we don't use sunk costs in projected cash flows because it's, it's done. We can't recover it. Um, it does not mean that the definition of being incremental does not meet the definition of being incremental if the expense must be paid regardless of your decision concerning the project. So that's a good explanation of um, what we would include and what we wouldn't include, right? So meeting the definition of being incremental, uh, the expense, if the expense is paid regardless of your decision concerning the project, then it wouldn't be considered an incremental expense. And that's a sunk cost is a good example of that. Um, some new products or services reduce or increase sales as well as costs or reduce or increase necessary assets for other already existing products and services. And those changes to the cash flows of the other projects are incremental to the new project as well. So if it creates, if the new project creates additional cash flows that are incremental, then we need to include them. And therefore, they should be included in the new project's cash flows. Now, a big thing to keep in mind is uh, financing costs aren't counted as expenses of the project. And the reason for that is because um, the interest payments to debt holders and dividends paid to stockholders, those are actually included in the cost of capital and in the weighted average cost of capital that we learned about last lecture, I believe, or the lecture before. So the financing costs are already included uh, when we use the weighted average cost of capital or whatever our cost of capital is determined for the project. Um, it has already be included in the discounted cash flows that we calculate. So don't include your financing costs when you're doing pro formas and cash flow estimates because you'll be double counting them. And... Uh, messing up the uh, outcome of your calculations. Big thing with uh, these types of um, problems and calculations is 
being sure you have the timing of cash flows correct. So the present is always considered zero. One would be a year from now or a period from now. We're usually dealing with a year. Two would be two years, three would be three years. Uh, you will often have an initial cash flow in year zero when you're doing these estimates. Um, you could have cash coming in, but often it's cash going out for equipment or something like that, purchasing new equipment, installing them. Sometimes you'll get a cash flow for sale of old equipment. Uh, and there are tax implications when you sell equipment, which we will cover in our detailed example a little later on. And changes in network and changes in working capital as well. Operating cash flows, uh, those are cash flows that occur during the years of the project's operation. And those are revenues, costs, and taxes. And of course, change in working capital as well falls under that. You'll often see some salvage uh, cash flows uh, when you're dealing with purchasing new equipment. Um, so, and salvage occurs in the last year. It's also called the terminal value of the equipment. And that occurs when we sell the equipment. And then there are tax implications on that as well. And in the last year, there could be changes in working capital as well. And there could be other considerations to include in our estimates and calculations. You'll be working with uh, free cash flow. You need to understand what that is. And it's just used as a measure of the total amount of available cash flow from a project. And we talked about that in chapter two. Um, some of the differences from the calculations in chapter two that we saw is in this case, free cash flow numbers will be estimates, right? Because the project doesn't happen. We're doing basically capital budgeting to estimate what the results are going to be. And free cash flow will be calculated on potential project individ individually rather than across the firm as a whole when we're doing um, these capital projects, capital budgeting calculations. There are some expenses that aren't cash expenses. The big one is depreciation or amortization which you will see in income statements um, because it is an allowable expense for tax purposes and financial reporting. And uh, what depreciation and amortization does is it just reflects the reduction in value of an asset over time due to wear and tear. Uh, but depreciation isn't an actual payment, so you don't have cash flowing in or out because of depreciation. What you have is the value of an asset being uh, decreased and then you're allowed under um, accounting practices and under tax practices to include that depreciation as an expense. And income taxes are computed after the depreciation cost is deducted. So taxes are a cash flow that is impacted by depreciation. So you can calculate, you will have to calculate, uh, you know, tax savings that result because of depreciation, but you're not going to include depreciation itself. So you'll put depreciation in to compute the taxes, then you remove the depreciation and you leave the tax portion in the capital budgeting estimates. So again, from a US perspective, the IRS defines depreciable, depreciable basis for real property to be the sum of cost amounts paid for items such as sales tax, freight charges, installation and testing fees. So when you purchase um, new assets, these additional expenses uh, can be included in the depreciable value of that asset. There are two types of depreciation methods, uh, straight line and MACRS. That's really a US term. And it's just a, when you uh, calculate depreciation and amortization at an accelerated rate. And there are different ways to do that. It can be double, it could be quadruple, it could be a lot of different ways. We'll go over some examples too. Straight line is the easiest and we'll deal with that most often, but you will be dealing with other types of depreciation. And so straight line, straight line depreciation is just uh, annual depreciation for each year. It's equal to the depreciable basis minus the projected ending book value. And you just divide all of that by the number of years in the life of the asset. And we will go over some examples and that'll make a little more sense. Uh, the IRS requires depreciation calculations using the half-year convention or the half-year rule. It's the same with Canada, with CRA. So when you purchase a new asset that uh, you can depreciate for tax purposes, 
uh, you are only allowed to use uh, half of the value in that first year. So this half year convention essentially says that property placed in service during a given period is assumed to be placed in service at the midpoint of that period. So it doesn't matter when you buy the asset, you could buy it on the first day of the year or the last day of the year. You're only going to include depreciation based on half of its value. And asset classes for depreciation, it's they'll be based on according, based on the length of the asset and its use. And we'll see some examples of how that rolls out. So this is just an example of straight line depreciation with the half year convention. There are different uh, um, periods, uh, the year above on the top row, that's the recovery period for the uh, investment. And by recovery period, it's how means how long it takes for you to recover the um, cost of that asset using depreciable depreciation expense, basically. But if you'll see in year one on the first row here, year one on the left hand column, and then you go across here, you have 20% for the first asset 16.67, 14.29, 12.5, 12 and 10%. So this is the half year rule applied, you'll see in the second year, uh, there's a typo there for the first one, it should be 40% rather than 44. Right. So the depreciation for this particular asset, in the first column under the 2.5 is 40%, 40% per year. But in year one, you can only take half of that amount. And the other assets in this chart are the same, right? So in year two, you'll see that the depreciation rate is double of the first year for each of these. So that's just applying that half year rule or half year convention. So we can have uh, accelerated depreciation, which we often see for certain types of uh, assets, um, different asset classes. And this allows firms to expense more of an asset's cost earlier in the, in the asset's life. And governments do this to give a benefit to firms. The idea is that they should, they will uh, purchase more capital goods because they can depreciate them faster. Um, a big example of that uh, is in Northern Alberta in the oil sands. Um, it used to be, I'm not sure what changes they made. Some changes were made around 2014, I think. But it used to be, uh, if you were operating a uh, oil sands, um, an oil sands project in Alberta, you could write off all of your capital costs against the royalties you would pay to the government of Alberta for the bitumen you're, you're extracting. So that would be an example of accelerated depreciation and it was industry specific. And that's often how it is with accelerated depreciation. And double declining balance is a method you would have seen in accounting, financial accounting. And it results in double the depreciation rate used for the straight line method. And this is just an example of a normal recovery period, normal recovery period with some accelerated depreciation at the beginning. So this like 44.45 on the second column from the left and the second row under year two here, that would be an accelerated depreciation. So would all of these actually, it's 32%, 24.49, 18, 9.5. And it just depends, right? So in questions, this will be given to you in real life. Um, it's gonna depend on the asset and what the federal government tells you. I saw a hand go up, go ahead and ask, ask a question if you have one. Hi. So Hi. I still don't know what are those numbers at the top called mm -hmm. three, five, seven, ten, and fifteen. That's just the recovery period for the particular asset. So if you look at um it's three years for the first one, it's five years for the next one, seven years for this one, uh, as in the middle one, ten years for the second from the right and 15 years for the last one on the right. So what that means is that you'll recover the full cost of your capital asset um, through a depreciation that you're allowed to claim as a taxable expense. So yeah, I know it's a little confusing this on top, the bold numbers, right? But that's just the recovery period. So how long it takes for you 
to recover the value of that asset that you invested in. Thanks. Okay. Uh, again, U.S. perspective, but we often see similar things in Canada. Um, so there is some bonus depreciation um, under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 in the USA, and it increased the deduction from 50% to 100% of purchase price on qualified property placed in service after September 27, 2017 and before January 1st, 2023. So there were certain qualified capital assets and pieces of property that um, the US federal government said, okay, you can actually expense the entire purchase price of this capital asset um, when you purchase it or claim the full full per, the full price actually uh, rather than the 50 percent so um and you'll see that often uh, and some of the questions you do you'll see specific examples of that and the question will give you you know the government has said this type of property can be rapid rapidly depreciated and here's the method that you'll depreciate it and how fast you'll depreciate it so then you have to calculate the amount etc but you'll see this often um it happens in canada too a lot of these changes come every uh, five to ten years depending on the government at the time and what the economic situation is but uh, we had some changes similar to this uh, in canada probably about 10 15 years ago and again us example section 179 deduction is targeted at helping small businesses uh, you don't need to worry about those particular things but uh, you in the questions you need to apply them and they'll give you the information so now, in terms of calculating our operating cash flow, um, that can be, that's where we make mistakes, sometimes get a little bit confused. That's where you'll see um, uh, questions throwing pieces of information at you basically to test your understanding, right? So recall that our free cash flow components are constructed as opposed to taking them from an income statement someone else has produced. So we put them together. It's helpful to conduct calculations by using a a quasi income statement. So you put together um, this quasi income statement, including the um, elements of that income statement that we need to change. So your operating cash flow is equal to your EBIT, which is earnings before income tax, multiplied by one minus the applicable tax rate plus your depreciation. So you're adding back your depreciation in this case because it's not actually a uh, cash expense. And typically, um, fixed assets, they're always, there will almost always be a fixed asset change at both beginning and end of a project when we're doing capital budgeting, right? Because we're dealing with capital assets. At the beginning of a project, um, the change in gross fixed assets is equal to the assets depreciable basis. And we'll see in examples how that works out. And at the end of the project, tax consequences from the sale of any asset must be considered as well. So the after-tax cash flow formula is the market value of your capital asset minus your market value of the capital asset minus the book value. So the book value is what uh, it shows in your books, in your financial or your accounting uh, information after applying depreciation, and then all multiplied by the tax rate so you'll have to remember your uh order of operations when you're doing these things of course right like you do what's in the brackets first um then you do multiplication bed mass i think we call it something different now but brackets exponents division multiplication addition subtraction right so you have to make sure to follow that that um, rule in terms of order of operations otherwise your calculations will be wrong so you'll do what's in the brackets first oops multiplied by the tax rate and then subtracted from the market value. But again, we will be going over a, a full example here, um, probably about 10 minutes or so. Now, in terms of calculating changes in net working capital, uh, through business cycles, a company will have to fund the purchase of materials and employ, pay employees before selling the product and eventually getting paid. So it needs a certain level of cash and other short-term assets to get through that cycle. And that is what we call working capital. It can be a bit of a, um, 
uh, it can be a bit of a vague description sometimes of working capital, right? In financial accounting, we have a definition for working capital. It's current assets minus current liabilities. But in this case, using corporate finance, our working capital is the level of cash and other short-term assets that we need to get through a cycle. And that's usually going to be given to us when we're working on questions. In the real world, you're going to determine what that is based on your knowledge of the company that you're working with or the operation, and you'll calculate working capital requirements. But we do report the change in the level of working capital as the um, net working capital cash flow. And it's most straightforward to assume that we need networking capital at the beginning of the project, and then we get it back at the end. So we'll put this additional networking capital into the project at the beginning. The project goes through its life, and then at the end of the project, we're going to have a positive cash flow for that networking capital amount. And there's a more complicated version, which you'll see as well, and that is when working capital needs to be adjusted each year. So you record the change. Uh, that year based on what the needs are. And in the example we go through, you'll see that um, it's different every year. It's not really complicated. It's just additional steps, right? So if you have a five-year project and you have to change your, calculate your networking capital needs for every year, you're going to do it five times rather than once. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward calculation as you'll see. So now we'll go through a, a nice detailed example um, for a company producing a computer game and um, doing some capital budgeting on it. The price of the, the game per unit is $39.99. We have here on the right, three years is the project life. And we have our estimated unit sales per year, 15,000 in year one, 27,000 in year two, and 5,000 in year three. We have a variable cost per game of 425. We have fixed costs per year of 150,000. We have startup costs. We have to purchase a software processing machine for $75,000 and to ship it and install it is 2000. We also have game development costs for the new game uh, totaled 150,000. And our networking capital requirements at the beginning of each year will be 10% of the projected sales during the coming year. So this is an example, we're gonna to have to calculate networking capital each year, but it's just 10% of projected sales during the coming year. And the tax rate is given to us as 21%. So that processing machine that we're purchasing, it's straight line depreciated over the life of the project. And it's gonna have a value of $5,000 when the project is finished. And we expect to be able to sell the machine for 2000 after we're done with it. So the sale price, like the market value of the machine versus the book value are quite different in this case. Um, our new game is going to decrease sales of an older game currently on the market. So the old game will lose sales of 2000 units per year throughout the life of our new game that we're releasing. The old game sells for $19 and 99 cents and has variable costs of $3.50 per unit. So we will see here our variable costs and our sales um, based on the information we're given. So we have $15,000 in sales in year one multiplied by $39.99 per unit. And you'll see the sales adjust in the following two years that go up significantly in year two. Down significantly in year three, we have our variable costs calculated, right? It's just that 425 per unit multiplied by the number of units per year. And then our net incremental and variable costs for the financial performers, our sales um, overall, we're going to have a change in sales of 559,870 in year one. And that's based on the sales of the new game, how many units we're selling, subtracting the decreased sales of the existing game we have in the market. If you recall, it's going to be um, 2,000 units per year, right? So that's this 39,980 that we're deducting in each year from the sales of the new game. And then our variable costs, we need to adjust those too, right? So we have a variable costs for the new game of 62,750 in the first year, less the variable costs for the game that's currently on the market and those sales are going to decrease. 
So that's why you see the 63, 750 minus 7,000. We're netting it all out and we do it for each year. So there are a lot more steps when you're doing capital budgeting and <laughs> it can be easy to make a mistake. So you have to be diligent. So for our initial cash flows, we have a new equipment cost for a project. We have no sale of old equipment. Uh, we have change in networking capital and we'll compute that later because the networking capital impacts all years of the project and it's based on sales for the coming year. So our purchase price of a new equipment, as we recall from a few slides back, that software processing machine, $75,000. We include our $2,000 for shipping and installation into our depreciable value for the asset, which is now $77,000. And we are assuming straight line depreciation. So we're going to use the beginning book value minus ending book value of the asset over the depreciable life of the asset. So in that case, it's at 77,000 for purchase, shipping and installation, minus the $5,000 book value that we're estimating at the end of the project divided by three years. So our depreciation is $24,000 per year for this um, piece of equipment. And calculating our operating cash flow, that formula is EBIT minus taxes plus depreciation. And again, EBIT is your earnings before interest and taxes. And it's, it, it is very useful to use a pro forma income statement approach to calculate operating cash flows because um, it's just a little more organized and we could see everything in place and check our work. And always, again, remember to leave out your interest expense, as we discussed earlier, because that's already included in the discounting and um, time value of money calculations we'll be doing because we are using a discount rate or a weighted average cost of capital rate for um, for uh, doing our present value calculations and interest will be included in that. So here's an example of this quasi income statement, right? You have your sales of FinProf, the new, uh, the new game, and then you're subtracting out your reduced sales of the existing game for 39,980 per year. And we set it up for all three years of the projects. We have a variable cost that we calculated, um, our re reduced costs for the existing game. And those are those variable costs per unit. Then we have incremental variable costs, which are based on the um, number of units we sell for the new game. Our fixed costs were given to us and they stay at 150,000 per year each year. Our depreciation, we calculated a couple slides back for the new equipment, it's 24,000 per year. So our earnings before interest and taxes, we can calculate now because we have our net incremental sales and our net incremental costs and our fixed costs and depreciation. So we calculate our earnings before interest and taxes for each year. Then we can calculate our taxes. That's based on the 21% tax rate that was given to us. And then we calculate our net income, add back our depreciation, right? Because it's not an actual cash expense. And then we get our operating cash flow for each of the three years. So $284,005 in year one, $622,820 in year two, and $1,659 in year three. And then we go on. Somebody had a question. I saw a hand pop up a few minutes ago. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, how do we get to the reduced sale of market prof or the reduced cost, the 39 980 and 7,000. Like, how do we get to those figures? Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of figures in here, so it's easy to, <laughs> to miss those. So it, we were told at the beginning of the example that um, the new game, this FinProf, is going to cut into sales of, we'll call it market prof. So it's going to decrease sales by, I think it was 2,000 units per year for market prof, the existing game. So it's at 19.99 is the selling price per unit for the existing game multiplied by 2,000 uh, fewer units per year. That's how you get this 39,980 per year uh, on the second line. And the reduced costs of marketing prof, I think you asked about the $7,000. What that is, is that's the variable cost per unit for the existing game was given to us as well. And then that's just multiplied by the 2,000 units. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
And at the end of the project, we're going to need to consider tax consequences, right? Because we're going to sell that asset we purchase. And there are tax consequences, of course. So if we sell the asset for more than its book value, we have a gain on the sale. And this is the case with the sale of any asset. Um, and if you sell the asset for less than the book value, then you have a loss on the sale. So the after tax cash flow is based on the market value minus the tax implications and extended out that formula that we touched on probably about five or six slides back is market value minus the market value minus the book value multiplied by the corporate tax rate. And so in this case, we have a $2,000 market value that was given to us for the new piece of equipment we're buying. And we, it's, it's going to have a book value of $5,000 at the end of the uh, three-year project. So the middle piece of this equation in the brackets, the 2,000 is market value minus our book value. Then multiply that first by the 21%. And then you're going to get a negative 630 in between these two brackets in the middle. And then because you have a negative in front of the brackets, it's going to end up being positive. That's how you get the 2630. Um, again, right? And some people might miss this, but the order of um, um, order of operations in terms of uh, mathematics rules you have to follow, right? So you can't just go, uh, you have to do it this way. <laughs> I, think, I think most people be aware of that. I know some of you are freaking fabulous at math, but if you see a mistake, it'll, it may often be your, your order of operations being incorrect, right? So you got to do your, multi, your brackets first, your multiplication and division, and leave your adding and subtracting until the end. And that's how you come up with this 2630. And so that's going to be a positive cash flow at the end of our project. Now our changes in network and capital um, seems like a lot, but it's just a number of steps and they're easy calculations, right? It was given to us that for each year, our network and capital requirements are going to be 10% of the projected sales during the coming year. So for this project, we have 59,985 at uh, required network and capital for time zero at the beginning. It's based on the sales that are coming up here in year one. Right, so a year ahead, basically. Um, in year one, our network capital is based on 10% of the sales that are going to be in year two. In year two, it's based on 10% of the sales are going to be in year three. And we're netting out the previous working capital from the prior year. So uh, if we were just doing the net network and capital once, we would have it in year one. You'd see it um, going out, and then you'd see it coming back in at the end of the project. Then you put it all together by year. So you have your current period times zero, uh, your fixed asset purchases, your network and capital requirements, less your, um, your IOC, and then you get your free cash flow. And you, in time zero, it's negative, which makes sense because you're making investments to acquire new equipment and start a new project. And then in year one, um, we get a free cash flow of 236 and $17. In year two, uh, 710, 798. In year three, 24,284. So a problem that often arises when we're asked to choose between two different assets that can be used for the same purpose. Um, and you'll often see that, right? Where you have multiple options, two assets, sometimes more. It typically doesn't require the computation of incremental free cash flows, but it does require that you take the two alternative sets of incre incremental cash flows associated with the two assets and restructure them so that they can be compared to one another. And we will go over an example of that here. So, and then the idea behind this equivalent annual cost or EAC approach is to use time value of money to turn each iteration of each project into an annuity. And then by turning it into an annuity, we can calculate the present value and then compare which one, which project is better. So we can consider the stream of iterations of doing the project again and again and again as a stream of annuities, all with equal payments, or in other words, as a perpetuity, right? So if 
an annuity carries on forever and the amount doesn't change, it becomes a perpetuity, if you recall from quite a few lectures back. And to compute and use the EACs of two or more alternative assets, first we're going to find the sum of the present values of the cash flows for one iteration of A and one iteration of B. This would be two assets, asset A and B. Then we're going to convert them into annuities by annuitizing the present value of the cost with life equal to the life of the respective assets. And then we'll solve for each asset's EAC. And that's going to be our payment when we're doing our um, time value of money calculation. And then we choose the asset with the lowest EAC, so the least to negative. And we'll see an example how that works. So our firm needs to buy a delivery truck and has two options purchase a high quality truck for $60,000. The truck will last seven years with operating costs of 5,000 per year, or we could purchase a lower quality truck for $40,000 and it will last five years with operating costs of $6,500 per year. And our cost of capital is 10%. So, you know, when we see something like this, I know right away, I started trying to do it in my head and guessing which one is going to be uh, the better purchase but you can't really tell without putting all the numbers through, right? You can, some people can, who are excellent at math and can do this all in their head, but uh, it may not be as obvious as you think. So it's good just to go through, don't take any guesses, <laughs> go through and do the numbers. So for the high quality truck, first we're gonna add the additional cost to the present value of operating costs. So we have $60,000 and then plus present value of operating costs. I thought we missed a slide. It shows it after. Present value of our operating cost is $24,042. For the lower quality, low quality truck, we have the present value of all our costs is $40,000 for the purchase price. Press present value of $24,640. So the present value of all of our costs for the lower quality truck is $64,640. And for the higher quality, it's $84,342. So, and the way we came up with that is we can use our a financial calculator is the easiest way for the high quality truck. For the high quality truck, uh, it's a seven year, seven years is our N, our interest per year is 10% for both projects. Um, our present value is negative 24342. And that's that present value of the operating costs. Our payment is $5,000 per year. And that is, um, again, the operating costs of the uh, high quality truck and zero future value. And then for the low quality truck, uh, we'd use the same method, of course, right? Except we're doing five years instead of seven. The present value is slightly different that we calculated. And our payment is different, right? Because our maintenance costs and operating costs are higher for the lower quality truck at $6,500. And our future value is going to be zero for both of them. So then, and by doing that, we were able to calculate all of our payments. And now we have our total present value, um, which is that uh, for the high quality truck was this, $60,000 purchase price plus the present value of the operating costs for seven years. And for the low quality truck, it's 40,000 plus the present value of operating costs for five years. So this is the output is uh, based on the payment is what we're looking for. That's our output in these cases, right? We use the total present value for each asset. Um, the interest per year is the same, 10 years, but we have to watch the life is different, right? The high quality truck truck is for seven years and the low quality is for five years. And then we calculate our payment. So our costs for the high quality truck, oops, I thought it showed you on the next one. Our costs for the high quality truck works out to $17,324 and our cost for the low quality truck works out to $17,052. So in this case, the low quality truck is actually a better deal because overall it's going to cost us almost $300 less than the high quality truck. 
they're essentially the same, right? But you're looking at a couple hundred dollars, about two hundred and seventy-five dollars in terms of difference. Uh, yep, someone had their hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, would you go to the next slide, please? This I one? Mean, uh, no, the other one. Next one, I think. No, the last one you just showed. Um... This is slide thirty-nine. This is forty. So this is the one. Let's okay. say um, on the exam or quiz, mm -hmm. you're asking um, which of these two are better option. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that, that the low quality track is a lower number, yeah. but we like, isn't the judgment objective um, in terms of the time value? Like the low, low quality is five years and mm -hmm. the quality is seven years. Like mm -hmm. how would you assess the answers in this case? Well, you, you're doing it because you, you have a, a present value, right? So you're comparing, as we say in English, apples to apples or oranges to oranges, because even though they have different years, we have accounted for that by doing it all based on present value, right? So we're looking at all the costs. Um, so even though the high quality truck is over a seven year period and the low quality truck is over a five year period, um, we still know the total cost of each. So for an exam, you would look just at the dollar amounts. Um, I won't ask for a subjective <laughs> answer. I will just keep it straightforward, right? Like in this, uh, and you'll see with most of the questions, I think too, that you do uh, for the assignments and stuff, it's just gonna be a matter of which is the lower cost. And that will work out to being the better option in this case. Um, so and I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I wanna add to that. So I guess, yeah, the five years and seven years doesn't really matter because we're accounting for the cost of each option over its life. Um, I think that's about it. Does that answer your question? Yes. It yeah, does. okay. Yeah, so just, uh, you Time know, I guess. Calculated. Yeah, exactly. So it, it considers everything. So you wanna just look at the, in this case, we're dealing with the cost. So we wanna go with the lower cost, which is the lower quality truck because it's, Overall, it's slightly less expensive. Um, you'll see questions where you're not dealing with cost, but you're dealing with net present value. So the value of all the cash flows from a project coming in and which one has the higher net present value. And that's basically how you're going to determine which one's better. So when it comes to a cost like this, we wanna go with the lower cost because it's a bit of a better deal when it comes with how much we're gonna earn and calculating earnings from a project, from a capital project, then we're gonna look at whatever has the higher net present value. And we will be covering some of that, uh, I think next class, some other examples that um, go more in depth. So this is all pretty straightforward right now, just to start us off on capital budgeting, but we will be doing more. So um, yeah. That's uh, that's it for this lecture. Uh, 